everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, so welcome to CAR-T, Understanding This Exciting New Therapy. Uh, I am Dr. Dan Platt. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of GRIT Health. Uh, we have a great session planned for you today. Um, so joining me on our panel uh, is Dr. Fiona Ahn, who is from Bristol-Myers Squibb, who are generously sponsoring this session. Um, we also have uh, now three patient panelists, uh, one of which cannot talk because she has laryngitis, but um, maybe we'll get some, some interpretation from her. Um, so we have Mary Catherine, uh, Ben, and Kristen. So thank you all so much for being here, all three of you. And then also from the uh, cancer support community, we have uh, Rachel Sachs, who is the Senior Director for Education. So we're really excited to have her as well. Um, so the way that our session is gonna be set up today, uh, so Dr. Ahn and I are gonna be tag teaming a little bit of an overview of CAR T cell therapy or chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy. Um, and then we'll bring in Ben and Mary Catherine and Kristen to talk a little bit about their story of receiving CAR T and what the experience was like. Um, and, you know, and ask them some questions. We'll be able to take, be taking questions in the chat. So um, please feel free to use the chat uh, for any questions you may have. Um, and then we'll bring in Rachel to talk about some of the great educational materials that CSC um, is producing in the CAR-T space and really helping patients to get uh, their heads around what is a pretty complicated new therapy. Um, so just a, a few housekeeping uh, things to mention before we get started. Um, so first is that um, please feel free to drop those questions in the chat. Uh, you can also use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Um, we'll be taking questions at various points throughout the discussion. Um, so don't be, don't hesitate to use that. Um, number two is that uh, this is chat is informational only. So uh, if you have a medical question, we won't be able to handle individual cases. Uh, so please just do bring that to your own doctor and healthcare team um, and make sure that, uh, that you have a discussion with them. And with that, I think we can kick off. So I'll have uh, Dr. On please introduce yourself first. What an honor to be here. Thank you so much uh, to our patients panelists and all the, the patients calling in. Um, so my, my name is Fiona An. Uh, I'm one of the doctors working uh, in the pharmaceutical industry. I work for a company called the Bristol Myers Squibb. Uh, so I'm very fortunate uh, to be part of the innovation, the CAR T therapy. Um, so today we are going to uh, talk about uh, just very exciting new treatment. So I started off to just give a very brief overview about uh, CAR T therapy. Um, so we, we cannot talk about CAR T without sharing a little bit about T cells. So we all know we have our a natural defense system in each of us. So the T cells play a very important role. The T cell is part of the, the blood cells, uh, but it has the specific function that protecting our body from diseases. For example, um, if we're infected with virus, the T cells actually have the, the function to recognize uh, the cells that are infected with virus. Um, so the CAR T cells are, you know, are a way of boosting this function. Um, so, so how is that increased and boosted? It's because T cells, the structure of the T cells on the surface, there is a protein complex. It's sort of like, a, I like the analogy, you know, kind of like the antenna on the, on the ends. So they use the antenna to sense the, the, the environment and then to, um, to detect what's going on around them. Um, so T cells is the same. So T cells have these antennas and we call it T cell receptors. And the T cells use these receptors to find the cells that are abnormal. Uh, so CAR T cells, the, this technology basically is, has a super antenna installed on the T cells. Um, so thank you, Dan, for, for sharing this uh, slides. I hope everybody can see it on the screen. Uh, so I'll walk step by step about how this is going to work. So basically, we all have our own T cells in our body. So there, the, the first step is to um, withdraw these T cells is through a process called a phresis. 
So, so you will be in the hospital and then your blood will be, part of the blood will be removed and then to retrieve your own T cells. And then these T cells will be uh, shipped in a special shipment to a facility or a, a special laboratory. And then, then we move to the step number two. So these T cells uh, will be given, um, a, we call it a vector. So the vector are kind of like a cancer cell tracking devices and the, the vectors will be attached to these T cells. Um, and then the number three is that once the vectors are attached, and then we let these, like uh, the engineered or modified T cells to grow in the optimal environment, usually is at the right temperature, right humidity, and then the, allow it to grow uh, extended time. Sometimes it takes a couple of weeks for these cells to expand, basically multiply. So we can grow from limited number of these special T cells to millions of them. And then uh, all these cells, uh, when they're ready, they're going to be put in the bags and then they'll be shipped back to the hospital. And then that's the way you enter the, the, slab number, the step number four, which that, uh, that you will uh, go back to the hospital. And then uh, sometimes uh, in order to get prepared, to, for the CAR T infusion, you will get some the chemotherapy, uh, the regimen, we call it the conditional regimen. So the purpose of that is to uh, remove the cancer cells as much as we can to get the body uh, ready to receive these new T cells, these modified and the super, super T cells. And then when the T cells are infused back and the, they are uh, real, they will be really busy they will be floating around in the body and because of the super antenna they have uh, many many folds of sensitivity in comparison to the original t-cells these boosted t-cells will be able to find the cancer cells they are targeting and bind to the cancer cells and eventually killing the the, the cancer cells um, so so I, that's number five so yeah. these therapies there are a lot of data show that the CAR T therapies are one of the, the most amazing and effective therapies. Um, the, the biggest benefit of the CAR T therapy that a lot of other therapies so far were not able to deliver is the, uh, the free of other drugs for extended time. So, so if uh, it works for a patient and a lot of times the patients can be cancer free drug-free for extended times. Um, so, so the patient can get their lives back and you can go back with your families. So it's a really amazing, amazing therapy. Um, so I'm sure later on our patients, Ben, Mary, uh, Catherine, and, and Kristen will be able to, to speak about their experiences. Um, so um, with all these amazing benefit, of course, like a lot of other therapies, there are some side effects because it's, uh, it's, it is modified T cells, it is still foreign to the body. So sometimes, occasionally, not all the patients will experience that, but all the patients receiving CAR T will be monitored very closely. Uh, a lot of times uh, you have to stay very close to the hospital in the hotel, and also you have to monitor monitor your your, your uh, temperature very closely because occasionally um, uh, some uh, the the patients receive CAR T therapies they will have um, a, a type of side effects called the cytokine release syndrome. And uh, occasionally there could be also some uh, neurotoxicities and uh, some because of the, the super T cells, they kill a lot of cancer cells and the, sometimes the immune cells also get impacted and sometimes there could be infections related to the CAR T therapy. So, so your doctors and all the nurses and the whole therapy team will be monitor the patients receiving CAR Ts very, very carefully. Um, so, so okay. far, um, there okay. are several, Dan, please go ahead. Oh yeah, I was, I was just gonna, so 
we we provided a ton of information here. So it would be great maybe to to boil it down around a few key things. So. Um, Dr. On, you mentioned that really CAR T is a form of immunotherapy. So it really is a, a form of cancer therapy that uses the body's own T cells. And T cells are a type of white blood cell. Um, so you have them floating around in your blood. And really the, the purpose of this, of this treatment is to take those T cells out of the body, supercharge them, yeah. make them more directed at the cancer and more likely to activate and do what a T cell normally does, which is kill cancer cells and bring other cells to the party to also help kill the cancer cells. And then you're going to put them back in the patient, right? So um, that's kind of the, the, the quick overview. And then Dr. Ron was also, uh, I think, uh, really kind of pointing out one, one question I really get a lot, uh, asked a lot is what makes this so exciting? as opposed to other forms of immunotherapy. Okay. Do you mind kind of talking a little bit about why the, the, the whole cancer community is so, so excited about CAR-T in particular? And then I'd love to also get into the application and what kind of diseases CAR-T is really targeting. Yeah, absolutely. It's a very good question. I, the people get really excited about this new technology because its efficacy is just unprecedented. It's a, for example, for multiple myeloma, now there are two CAR T therapies available. And the, the, um, for the relapse refractory multiple myeloma patients, uh, the other treatment options uh, usually they lead to about uh, 30 to 50% of response rate, probably maximum. But uh, these CAR T therapies, they can have over 80% of response rate. So basically eight out of 10 patients will respond to the, to the therapies. And uh, some of the patients are also have long durable remission. So we're talking about a few years, right? Um, we have some patients, uh, they, they're five years out of the CAR-T therapy, they are still drug-free and disease-free. So, so that is the part that the people are extremely excited because the quality of life uh, of um, our patients really dramatically changed is unimaginable with any other therapies. And I think similarly for leukemia and lymphoma as well, it significantly improved uh, the, uh, the efficacy and also the quality of life for patients. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I would also add, you know, so the patients that were have been initially treated with CAR T have been some of the most sick patients for whom other treatments haven't worked, um, and so they got into clinical trials. And CAR T was initially used in these very, very sick patients for whom other therapies and other pretreatments hadn't been as effective. So it was even working in the sickest patients, which was also super, super exciting. Um, and now it's starting to move into uh, actually less sick patients and we're starting to move up in the treatment paradigm as people get used to using it. But it still is early days. I think it's important to mention, you know, this treatment has been around for about 10 years in clinical trials. And the, as Dr. An was saying, some of the latest therapies have only come out in the last couple of years for diseases like multiple myeloma. Dr. An, I would love to talk about, um, so uh, why is CAR-T so effective for hematologic cancers or blood cancers? And what has, what's the movement been like to kind of for other solid tumors, for other diseases like lung cancer and breast cancer? Yeah, very, very good question. Um, so I was actually on a seminar uh, this week and uh, there have been a lot of um, studies or research being done nowadays in solid tumor site as well. You know, for example, in melanoma, cervical cancer, breast cancer, um, and uh, uh, glioblastoma. So um, the, I think the, the, the difference, the key difference of between the hematological malignancy and solid tumor is uh, in terms of the targets uh, on the cancer cells. Um, so we're very lucky that for, for the blood cancers, um, we have very clear antigens. For example, for lymphoma, we have CD19 as a target. And then for multiple myeloma, we have, we have B cell uh, maturation antigen. So these are pretty much the target only 
uh, like on the surface of the cancer cells, very limited uh, presence on the normal cells. So made it really ideal target for CAR T cell therapy. Uh, but the, for, for the solid tumor side, a lot of targets, they not only um, are present on the cancer cells, they are also on the normal cells. Uh, so it's a little bit challenging to find the right target for CAR T therapy for the solid tumor. I think that's probably the, uh, the biggest challenge for the solid tumor physicians and the, the researchers. Um, but I'm confident that with all the research, with all the new technologies and the, and the, the field is, is moving very quickly and that we will find ways for the, the other cancer patients as well. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Anna, I, I'll reiterate that because it's really, really um, exciting. Because so, uh, one of the the advantages of CAR T in the blood cancers is you can actually kill. For instance, if someone has a a, a cancer of their B cells, um, like a multiple myeloma or an acute lymphoblastic leukemia, you can actually kill all the B cells, and someone can live pretty well without without B cells. So, giving a a, a drug like CAR T you don't necessarily have to worry so much about some of the off target or uh, you don't have to worry about some of the, the normal cells that might die as much. Um, with something like a solid tumor, and we got a great question, part of the reason is you, when you target the solid tumor, you might also target some of the healthy cells. Yeah. So for instance, if let's say someone is targeting pancreatic cancer um, and they're targeting with a CAR T, there's a chance that that CAR T cell kills some of the pancreatic cancer uh, cells, but also maybe some normal cells in the pancreas and maybe that leads to, to diabetes. Um, so there's, you kind of have to consider a lot of different things and we're still, um, we're still in the stage of figuring out. There's also some questions about getting the CAR T cells to the solid tumor, right? So the great thing about blood is it's when you put something in the blood, it can get everywhere pretty quickly and you can attach to the correct cells. Um, with, a, with a solid tumor, you kind of have a mass of cells. So sometimes, you know, the T cells can only attack the if you think about like a globe, they can only kind of come at the, the first ring of cells and they don't necessarily get to the cells in the middle. So there's some problems that need to be overcome, but this is really, really exciting. Uh, and there's a ton of clinical trials now in the, in the solid tumor space for all these solid tumor cancers. So if you do have a solid tumor, it might be a good idea to look up some of these clinical trials because they're really, really exciting um, and they're, they offer a lot of promise. Um, so Dr. An, we're, we're kind of nearing the end of our, of our overview. Um, do you mind kind of giving a, a quick kind of summary of what you think are the key points uh, to remember about CAR T cell therapy for, for patients? And um, then we can start to, to actually hear from some of our patient panelists. Yeah, the, I, I think the key takeaway is that uh, this is a new therapy and this has been proven to be very, very effective for several disease areas. I think if you're interested in this therapy, don't be afraid to discuss with your physician about this. I think, you know, um, because there are a lot of opportunities out there. Uh, so there are the CAR T therapies uh, that your physicians can prescribe to you. And there are also the opportunities to participate in the clinical trials. As Dan mentioned, you know, there are resources. I'm sure um, Rachel could also speak about this. You know, there, there are ways you could participate, uh, participate in these clinical trials. So, so that also offers great opportunities to benefit from this therapy. It's, it's a really exciting time uh, for this, yes. this particular place in, in cancer research. And with that said, I would love to bring in some of our, our patient participants who have actually received CAR-T uh, cell therapy um, to tell you a little bit about their stories and answer some questions. And we'll have uh, hopefully a nice discussion about their experience. Um, so we have on the line, um, we have Ben, uh, we also have Kristen. It looks like we might have lost one of our other participants, uh, Mary Catherine, but um, we're going to give each of you a chance to introduce yourself and tell us a little about your story. Um, and then we'll kind of take some questions and see where the conversation goes. Uh, so Ben, would, would love to hear from you if you can introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your uh, your cancer and your journey through CAR-T and, and your experience. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ben. Um, Let's cut right to it. So my story is a little different. Um, I was initially diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, in 2019. 
Uh, I did about six cycles of ABVD, um, did, you know, the PET scans, uh, final PET scan still showed I had a, a chest tumor. Uh, so I had a biopsy on it. And uh, while well, it came back as a diffused large B cell lymphoma, um, since I was already pretty much considered uh, refractory at that point, uh, the plan was to do a stem cell transplant. So I did the uh, Rice chemo regimen. Um, after doing uh, two infusions of that, I did a PET scan and well, nothing happened. Um, so they tried moving on to, uh, I believe it was uh, bendamustine and polituzumab. Um, that didn't do anything. It actually had my tumor grow a little bit. So they said, okay, you're going to do uh, CAR-T. Um, so I did all my uh, tests, workup, um, finally did my, um, my cell extraction. Um, about 20 days later, I went to a City of Hope in Duarte, California. Um, I was admitted. I did my uh, conditioning chemo. Uh, man, rough. It got me a little sick in the stomach mostly, but I handled it. And then a few days later, I had my, uh, my uh, CAR-T infusion, um, everything was going well, um, but then, you know, the, the fevers, um, other things started happening, uh, had a lot of phlegm coming up, um, had a CT scan uh, while in the hospital, and they said, hey, you have a severe uh, pneumonia. Um, so I was originally on about one liter of uh, oxygen, and then it went up to four, and before I knew it, I didn't know what was going on. And then uh, woke up and the, the nurse said, hey, pretend like you're going to throw up on three. So I did it. And then I saw the tube coming out. So I ended up being intubated for six days. Um, the pneumonia, they're not sure what it was caused by, if it was a direct side effect from the CAR T or if it was... Um, lack of immune system, and they're not sure if it was bacterial or um, fungal. Uh, I was on antifungal medicine, antibiotics. Um, pretty much what stabilized my lungs was um, the steroids. I had high dose steroids. Um, the transplant doctor was a little hesitant to use it because he said it could uh, ruin the efficacy of the CAR T cells. Um, but at that point, it was a matter of, hey, is this guy going to live or not? So um, they administered the steroids and it worked. Um, fast forward to uh, me getting out of the hospital a day after I did my PET scan and it was clean and it has been ever since. And that was in June of 2020. Ben, you had a really interesting experience with, with CAR-T, which is why it's also great to hear your story. So you had some of the some of the really potent side effects that Dr. Ahn was talking a little bit about, but then you also had this great result at the end where you had mm -hmm. a completely negative PET and you had, you had some pretty hefty disease um, that was resistant to treatment, resistant to a lot of different treatments. So um, can you tell us a little bit about your you know, your experience in the, in, in the hospital was so, um, you had so much going on from some of the side effects, including cytokine release syndrome, which was the fevers that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like, you know, looking kind of beyond that after finding out about your PET scan? And now what has it been like now that you've kind of, um, uh, you know, later on after some of these side effects to see kind of the, the impact of the CAR T cells? Well, one of the most um, significant impacts is that I have to receive IVIG infusions. Uh, my immunoglobulin levels are low. Uh, I kind of noticed it this year when my daughter started kindergarten or preschool. I mean, in the beginning of the year, she was bringing home, um, you know, colds, things that, you know, kids bring home. Um, and she was passing them on to me and I wasn't getting better. Um, the sickness was kind of lingering. Uh, so I spoke to my oncologist. Uh, she said, you know, we've already given you too many antibiotics to try and get rid of sinus infections or uh, respiratory infections. Um, so we're going to check your levels. And sure enough, my levels were low. So I've been receiving the IV, IG infusion since July of this year. Um, other than that, my, um, my white blood cell count lymphocytes, they're still on the low end. They're mm -hmm. normal, but on the very low end. Um, so then that, give, those are, those are given the what you do. 
sorry, given what you'd ex- what you've experienced, would you do CAR T again? Absolutely. Yeah, it's so. You know, it, it's there's this, there was a this long story Ben where you experienced some of the some of the potential worst side effects, and yet it's amazing to hear that you're so willing to go back to it. And mm-hmm. the reason being, of course, the the amazing efficacy that resulted. So, I think you know your story is really powerful because. You know, though those side effects, they're um, to and to be and to be clear, Ben's level of of uh, cytokine release syndrome was really was grade four, um, which is kind of the highest grade of cytokine release syndrome. Most people will experience like a grade one or a grade two reaction, um, which sometimes means that the kind of the cells are the CAR T cells are working because they're you know they're killing the cancer cells, stirring things up. But Ben's grade was was much higher, so it was much more serious. Um, so, you know, I think what, given what you, you've been through and kind of where your experience has been, it's, it's really powerful to, for me, especially to hear that, you know, this is something you would go back to in a heartbeat. So, um, thank you so much, Ben, for telling us a little bit of your story and we'll get into some more parts of it in a second. Um, Mary Catherine, I see we, we got you back. Um, so great to have you back. Um, could you, do you mind introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about your story and how you got to CAR T and then what your experience was like? Hi, I'm Mary Catherine. I was diagnosed with B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia in 2017 at the age of 24. I was treated at a children's hospital and did about two and a half years of chemo only pediatric regimen. I finished chemo in fall of 2019, but relapsed in May of 2020 with cancer in my blood, bone marrow, and spinal fluid. At the time of my relapse, we did genetic testing on my cells and found out that I have a Philadelphia-like chromosome, which can make the cancer a little more likely to come back. My pediatric oncologist gave me two options. One was a bone marrow transplant, and the other was to go to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia for a CAR-T therapy trial. I had no hesitations in choosing CAR-T as my first option. I was excited to travel out of North Carolina, and it just seemed like the much better option. I had a chance of keeping my fertility, my hair, and I wouldn't have to do radiation. And there was very tolerable bridging chemo until my cells were manufactured. I flew up to Philly to sign consent forms for the trial and had my cells collected for manufacturing at the same time. I was incredibly confident in choosing this trial and the doctor sat with me and my family and described every scary thing that could happen. And though they're frightening, they seem to be a little less scary than the bone marrow transplant risks. My only slight hesitation was after talking to the doctor about um, the neurotoxicity that can come along with CAR-T. I'd previously had a severe case of neurotoxicity that left me paralyzed on my left side for a couple of days. Um, The CAR-T team, they couldn't tell me if that put me at a higher risk or not, but they made me feel more comfortable when they told me they had a protocol to help it if it did happen. So it took about one and a half months for my cells to be manufactured. And after that, I went back up to Philly. It's important to mention that the trial paid for travel and lodging. Otherwise, I might have been forced into doing a BMT as my health insurance wouldn't cover travel or lodging. So my husband and I both took off six weeks from work and headed up to Philadelphia, where I had the conditioning chemo of cytoxin and fludarabine. Um, The chemo days were pretty long, and I just had some mild nausea, and during that time, I also met with cardiologists, getting an EKG or echo, uh, physical and occupational therapist, and the neurologist did some baseline tests with me. The following week, I received my T-cells, which would kill all of my cancerous B-cells, and the infusion was just like a glorified syringe with millions of my modified T-cells. I stayed in the clinic for the next hour to make sure I didn't have a reaction, then went back to the hotel like any other normal day. The next morning, I woke up extremely tired. I had an early morning appointment with my nurse practitioner, so went up to the hotel afterwards for a nap. I woke up with a cold sweat and a fever. It had been about 24 hours since my infusion and I was starting to feel the cytokine release syndrome. Um, I got checked into the hospital 
And the next day I could barely do anything. Like my body was so worn out and fatigued, like I had never experienced before since. Um, the CRS lasted about three days, but my fatigue got better each day. Um, I still couldn't exert a lot of energy um, the following couple weeks. And I also felt like a little off balance, which was probably a neuro issue. So I stayed in Philadelphia for the next few weeks for monitoring. So I had lots of time. I was able to work on physical therapy and took long walks around the city, which was a huge benefit. I feel like CAR-T gave me back my quality of life at that time and allowed me to get stronger. And it was a break from all the tough chemo I'd had. I went home to Raleigh after the six weeks and returned to Philly three months later for a routine lumbar puncture and bone marrow biopsy. They found I had a small percentage of B cells, but no cancer. So I'd be eligible to redo an infusion of my CAR-T cells. I ended up doing a total of four CAR T cell infusions to treat my early B cell return. Each time I had a different reaction to the condition in chemo, but never had issues, major issues with the CAR T cells themselves. At my one year checkup biopsy, they found I had 2% leukemia. So CAR T was not going to be my cure or last treatment. My last CAR T infusion was over last summer to prepare me for bone marrow transplant and to get me MRD negative. Um, however, I did not respond to the CAR T cells, so I had to seek other treatments to get me disease free. But CAR T played a role in allowing me to get, enter transplant in good shape and with strength. Now, after having both CAR T and a bone marrow transplant, I personally feel like I had a better go of the CAR T. Like, the extreme exhaustion was short-lived. I didn't have any significant neurological or other issues. And now after BMT, my fatigue is lasting like I'm almost a year out and I'm still struggling with fatigue. I've also experienced more side effects with the BMT, um, such as loss of fertility. And overall, CAR-T gave me a feeling of being a participant in my cancer fight the doctors made my own cells work for me. And overall, it was definitely less harsh than a bone marrow transplant. And now that I've had my transplant, if I were to relapse, I could do another round of CAR-T with my donor cells, um, which I would definitely do without thinking about it. Thanks, Mary Catherine. So you had a, also had a, a pretty interesting case because you also had some pretty um, you know, tough to treat disease. And CAR T for you though, it had some impact. It allowed you to, to really kind of um, get off other treatments and get stronger, mm -hmm. but it maybe didn't have some of the efficacy, the long, the long lasting efficacy, which, you know, um, it's important to understand that about CAR T that for some patients, as Dr. On talked about, you get a, a really great response and it's a longer lasting response. And then for other patients, you don't get the same level of response. So for you, you ended up having to go to bone marrow transplant anyways, but I, I think the really interesting part of your story is, and then both you and Ben's story, is that what CAR T also was able to kind of give you back. Um, so, are there? Would you do it again, Mary Catherine? You, you kind of said you would uh, now that you, you've had your bone marrow transplant. But yeah, can you tell us a little sure. bit about? I wouldn't have any hesitations, and it's cool to know that like my new donor cells, like they could form a response. Well once they're manufactured. Um, that's like a big relief for me just to know there's another option out there. So I'm, I'm uh, curious, uh, I, want to, I want to bring it over to Kristen here, but Kristen, our, our third patient participant, um, unfortunately has some laryngitis. So I don't know, um, Kristen, are, are you able to, to do a little talking or tell us about your story? Or do you have someone there who can tell us a little bit? Hi, my name is Benny. Um, I'm Kristen's caregiver. I was her caregiver through her cancer battle, and she can't speak. Um, her voice is pretty pretty low, but I could give a quick summary of, um, of what Chris, Kristen went through, if you'd like. That would be great. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, oh. So Kristen was diagnosed in 2010 with um, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. It presented as a bump on her head, which is pretty unusual. Um, when she went into the doctor, they, they just thought it was a, a, fatty, a, fa a fatty mass to be removed. But once they did the biopsy, they realized that it was leukemia. And that's 
when her life changed dramatically. Um, I didn't know Kristen at the time, and that was in 2010. She did two years of chemotherapy. Um, and after three years, or four years, or after, after two years, she relapsed, and the cancer came back, the same type of cancer. So she went into salvage chemotherapy. Um, at this point, I, I did know Kristen, and I was her caregiver during this time. And um, so she did salvage chemotherapy, and after the third round of chemotherapy, um, the, the chemo wasn't working. The, actually, the cancer was increasing, so they needed to find another alternative um, to beat the cancer. Luckily, um, at Stanford, there was a clinical trial. It was a clinical trial of multiple chemotherapies. Um, it was very strong. Um, it it, it um, did quite a bit to her body. Um, chemotherapy is, is uh, not an easy uh, medicine to, to take, um, but it did put her into remission, luckily. Um, and um, so she went into remission. This was about in the fall. And then with the idea that she was going to move on to a, a stem cell transplant as a cure for her cancer, her leukemia. Um, during the summertime, we were, going, we were going through all the appointments and preparation for the bone marrow transplant, but the cancer came back for the third time. Um, and this was in, middle, in the middle of the summer in 2014. Um, so the bone marrow transplant had to stop and she had to look for another alternative to go back into remission. Luckily, the Stanford doctor knew a doctor in Seattle um, that was doing um, CAR T cell therapy and Kristen applied and they responded. Kristen applied to several institutions throughout the country and Seattle did respond. Um, so Kristen flew up there and got her blood drawn through the, through the aspheresis process and um, they proceeded forward to and re-engineer her cells um, for CAR T cell. Um, but um, Kristen, what happened? Um, but, but there was no evidence of cancer. So she went there a little early. Um, she got her blood drawn, but then when they did a test, she didn't have, there was no evidence of cancer. It was a bit disappointing um, that she wasn't able to do the CAR T cell at that time. I know it sounds kind of strange to say she was disappointed that she didn't have cancer. She was very happy she didn't have cancer, but she really thought that CAR T cell was gonna be um, the cure. And it just makes so much sense to use your own you know, immune system to fight the cancer. Well, that cancer came back again a few months later. And so she was on her way to go do CAR T cell in Seattle, where we were, because I was with her. Um, this was in November um, 2014. Um, it was, um, there was some conditioning with chemotherapy. I'm not sure of the names. Kristen would definitely know the names. She so said cytoxin and fludarabin. Um, so we did a few days of conditioning. Then it was time for the CAR T cell. It was a very exciting day. Um, CAR T cell was pretty new in 2014. Um, and it was just very exciting. Um, Kristen was the first outpatient. They were still kind of tweaking the medication um, and learning how to, you know, how to give CAR T cells. And so Kristen was the first outpatient um, patient on this particular clinical trial. Um, and once she did receive the CAR, the CAR T cells, that night she spiked a fever and she had to go into the hospital um, right away. Um, Kristen's Symptoms um, were pretty mild. She did spike a fever several times, um, but I think she, she did really well. Um, she had a very low cancer burden at the time, and the doctors were kind of learning how, you know, how to modulate the, how many, you know, the CAR T cells, how much to give. So that was something kind of new and exciting that we learned. Um, so since her cancer burden was a bit small um, or low, they didn't give her as much CAR T cells. Uh, but it was a very exciting time. The doctors were very excited. Nurses were very excited coming into the, into the room and kind of peeking in the window. And we were all very excited as well. 
um, after about a few weeks, you know, Kristen did spike, spike a fever. And after a week or so of being in the hospital, um, she was released and she felt pretty, pretty good, actually. Um, we were able to walk around. She was fatigued quite a bit, but we, we were able to, to walk. And it's nothing like receiving other chemotherapies where your blood counts are really, really low. You have extreme fatigue, um, have to be very, very careful. We actually were able to walk around Seattle and see some of the sites, which was pretty incredible. Um, but they were, we were told that CAR T cell was only a bridge for the cure, that she needed to proceed with a bone marrow transplant. So in January 2015, Kristen did receive a double umbilical cord transplant, and um, that was quite a challenge. <laughs> But um, she went through that, and she would, she is in remission today after se after seven years. And thank you so much for uh, for speaking for Christian. What an amazing caregiver! We really really appreciate it, um, Christian. Uh, if you, I know you can probably hear me. Uh, thank you for for um, for joining us. And uh, even though you're you're sick, and I hope you feel better soon. Um, I think uh, you know a really interesting thing to note about Kristen's case is that it, she was really early in the process of CAR T development to be in a clinical trial in 2014. Compared to, to Ben and Mary Catherine, your clinical trials were relatively more recent, um, correct? Within the last five or so years, I think. Yeah. So, so Kristen had one of the early experiences when we didn't know that that much. And really, the other thing that I want to emphasize that I think is really important um, to talk about is a lot of times CAR T is used as this bridge. So for patients who are so sick that they're not able to, to get in remission, um, it makes a bone marrow transplant very hard to do. But CAR T, because of its high remission rate that Dr. Ahn was talking about, is one of the, the advantages of it is to take a patient who's very, very sick, get them into remission so that they can receive a bone marrow transplant. So Christian's case is a, is a, a great example. Of, of that type of use of the CAR T um, to get someone from, from here to there and then be able to get the bone marrow transplant. So thank you all three so much. Um, I wanna now bring um, Rachel into the conversation and uh, keep all, all of this going, but Rachel is here from Cancer Support Community. Can you uh, please introduce yourself, Rachel? Thanks, Dan, and thanks to uh, Dr. Ahn and um, everybody for sharing their story. So powerful and so meaningful. So my name is Rachel Sachs, and I'm the Senior Director of Education at Cancer Support Community, um, also formerly known as um, the former Gilda's Club. Um, and I'm a trained oncology, so <clears throat> excuse me, trained oncology social worker, and I've been in the healthcare field, um, really doing clinical practice in oncology social work uh, my entire um, career. Um, and prior to coming to Cancer Support Community, I was overseeing a comprehensive cancer center. But here at Cancer Support Community, we really um, focus on education pieces as one of the modalities about how we focus on our patients' um, psychosocial health and wellness. Um, we do that through policy and education, and I'm gonna talk about the education piece. And as um, you know, Mary Catherine and Ben and Kristen know, um, that it's really important when you're being diagnosed with something new, a chronic illness, um, that we all learn through different in various modalities. And we are different learners. So some of us learn better through written materials, um, some through visual like videos, through, some through webinars. And that's what we do really well at Cancer Support Community. We develop various different modalities to be able to get a very complicated topic like CAR-T across to both our patients and our caregivers and our healthcare providers. Um, we make sure that our materials are at the appropriate reading level, so eighth grade or below. Um, and several of our resources, including some of our CAR-T resources, um, are translated into various languages. In our CAR-T, there's a couple of resources translated um, and culturally adapted specifically in Spanish. We also, which is really important to note, um, use advisory boards. And those advisory boards are made up of advocacy organizations, um, patients and caregivers to really get their input when we're creating a, a material. Because if we're creating it, we might think it seems great, but we're not the ones who it's meant to be for um, until we're in that situation. It's for our patients and our caregivers. So we wanna get their input on our materials to make sure that they're going to be meaningful, um, that they're gonna come across the right way and that they're gonna be usable. 
Um, and like I said, with cancer and topics like CAR-T, it's critical to have various modalities. So we're going to drop, I think, in the chat some links um, through Cancer Support Community of our CAR-T resources, which we have a number of. And I believe Kristen um, was involved in helping us um, uh, patient focused test some of our resources. Um, and if you are interested in any of our resources, you can always contact me at Cancer Support Community, Rachel Sachs, and or visit www.cancersupportcommunity.org to look at our resources. But some of our virtual resources, um, we have four. Um, one is our Ask Ruby. I don't know if any people are familiar, but Ask Ruby, we actually started with Ruby. She's our virtual navigator. And when COVID-19 uh, hit, everybody had a pivot. And we had this virtual navigator um, who does quick, short films for us. Um, and she's an animated um, uh, person that will explain a complicated topic in simplistic ways. We also have a quick guide, um, which is about 10 to 12 minutes um, explaining CAR-T. We have another virtual um, resource about the therapy um, and journey of CAR-T, as well as one about side effects. We have various different written resources, um, including a fact sheet, which is about eight to 10 pages. And that includes our roadmap, which um, Dr. Dan Platt showed and Dr. Ahn explained in the very beginning about how to really understand the CAR-T process from the beginning and through the end. And what I really wanna make clear, and I think we can see through Mary Catherine and Ben's and Kristen's stories is that no one story of CAR-T and no one story of cancer is the same. There's gonna be variations, changes um, of that journey and what you might anticipate um, is also going to change. And our, all of our written materials, like I said, were developed from physician input, um, as well as um, uh, getting our patients to provide input. We also have a very extensive um, CAR-T patient and caregiver book, which is about 200 pages in length, and that's translated into Spanish. And we developed that with our providers, and we asked them questions like, when is this resource best to give to patients, and how... Um, can this resource best be used? And it was also patient tested. And it truly explains what CAR-T is, it breaks it down, the patient process, reviews clinical trials, which are complicated in itself, and there's a caregiver section and a logistics section. And I think there was a question that came through um, when Dan and Dr. Ahn were speaking about, can you get CAR-T at every center? And the answer is no. That's why Mary Catherine, you know, obviously traveled, um, from I think you said North Carolina um, to Philadelphia, which is my hometown. Um, and uh, you can't get it everywhere. Um, and I'll get to that in a minute about the importance of being able to research. Um, additionally, we have a smaller guide that um, is a much more compact version, about 30 pages of our extensive 200 page book. And that is much more interactive. There's a lot of fill in the blank uh, questions to ask providers and that's, I think, and Mary Catherine and Ben and Kristen could probably speak to this, really helpful. As we all know, when you go into a doctor's office, sometimes they have 15, 20 minutes, if that, to really talk with you and your caregiver about what's going on. So to have some resources that you can use and you can have pre-scripted questions and fill in the blanks so that you can fill in the answers, we find is really helpful and our patients have told us is extraordinarily helpful. And we also have a series of webinars that people can tune into um, that you can locate on our website. The last thing that I really wanna get into um, that we do at CSC is our concierge program. And we have a helpline at Cancer Support Community, but about a year ago, we launched a specific concierge program specific to CART-T. And it's built off of our helpline and we have a specified CART-T navigator and dedicated phone number. And she provides general information and questions and specific uh, information as well about CART-T. If you're eligible to enroll, that means those approved to receive a CART-T drug, you will get assigned this particular social worker and she will work with you on developing a treatment plan. You have a set scheduled phone calls, set up follow period, and then about um, 12 months or so post-treatment, there's a level of follow-up as well. Mm -hmm. And why is this important um, is because like uh, Mary Catherine said, in terms of you know lodging, in terms of um, 
you know, how do I for medications and things like that. This particular social worker is well-trained in CAR-T and can help one navigate as well as, um, you know, being a social worker, always go to your center where you are. And I'm sure um, Mary Catherine, Ben and Kristen can speak to this about speaking to your navigator, speaking to your nurses. They are there, you know, through thick and thin, speaking to your social worker, speaking to the financial navigator to help you navigate the, the CAR-T process and knowing that you're not in it alone. And then there's also people like the people that we listen to today that can help, um, you know, provide their perspective on the CAR-T process or the cancer process in general. But um, we have really in-depth resources um, that we are really proud of and that we think is, are really easy to navigate and can help with the CAR-T process. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, unfortunately, we are uh, at the time where we need to, to wrap up. Um, really appreciate everyone being here. Dr. Ahn, thank you so much for all your great information about CAR-T um, and, and really kind of getting to some of the science and the exciting nature of it. Um, I really want to thank our patient panelists, Ben, Mary Catherine, and Kristen, um, who told us about their story. And, and really, it, it was really helpful, especially, you know, I, I've heard your stories before, um, but it was really helpful to kind of really tell the difference between different experiences with CAR-T and what it can do. And, and to hear from you. So we really, really appreciate you being here. And then thank you so much, Rachel, for sharing uh, the great resources the cancer support community has. I really highly recommend them. They really bring patients into the equation and their resources are always so good. Um, I also wanna thank BMS for uh, Bristol-Myers Squibb for sponsoring this session and making Dr. On available. So thank you so much, everyone. Mm -hmm.